Welcome everyone, I'm Dina Zanfali, a PhD candidate in the Design and Computation group here at MIT. Um, this is the first uh, lecture in the Computation Lecture Series, um, organized by my colleague uh, Shara Zaman and uh, MIT professor Terry Knight. Unfortunately, Shara, or fortunately for him, uh, Shara is in Istanbul in Turkey uh, exhibiting uh, his work, uh, which is actually related to the um, lecture series uh, theme and today's lecture, actually. Um, um, the lecture series theme is uh, Wild Words and Tamed Minds. Um, uh, pro proliferation of digital and immersive media in creative practices increasingly challenges established boundaries between the real world and the digital world. What was once imagined, created, and consumed in digital media is now leaking into lived experiences, calling for perceptual and material existence. The lecture series Wild Words and Tamed Minds explores the emerging, uh, this emerging type of creative reality in relation to the notions of computing, embodiment, and narrative. The th series brings together designers, scientists, media theorists, anthropologists, and philosophers uh, to cultivate an interdisciplinary discussions on the theory of mind, body, and world. Today, I would like to welcome our first speaker in the lecture series, uh, uh, MIT professor uh, William Oricchio. And uh, William is a professor of comparative media studies at MIT and also uh, at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. He's a principal investigator of MIT's Open Documentary Lab. He explores the frontiers of interactive and participatory reality-based storytelling. His scholarly uh, research considers the interplay of media technologies and cultural practices in relation to the reconstruction of representation, knowledge, and publics. A uh, specialist in all media when they were new, that was my favorite part, he explores such things as early 19th century conjunctures between photography and telegraphy the place of telephony in the development of television at the other end of the 19th century, and the work of algorithms in our contemporary cultural lives. William has held professional appointments in Sweden, Germany, Denmark, and China, and received Guggenheim, Humboldt, and Fulbright Awards, and most recently, the Berlin Prize. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, William Oricchio. Thank you, William. Thank you. So thanks, thanks very much. Boy, those are, that always sounds so weird to hear uh, what one does. Um, so first of all, thanks. I'm really honored to be here. This is a, a, a terrific initiative. Um, although I have to say the tamed mind part worries me. I like to think I'm like more deranged than tamed, but, but uh, we'll have to find out what that, what that means. And I want to begin with a kind of double... Um, Proviso, maybe, or, or yeah, provisos are good enough word. One, this is, it's not like this is earth shattering what I'm going to say, but it is, it's, the opportunity to give this talk helped me to try to think through some things I hadn't connected before, and we'll see if it connects. I mean, it, it, I hope it does, but you'll be the judge. Um, and second of all, they, they really pressed me for a picture, an image when, when doing this. And I, I just spotted this um, penal treadmill. These were used a lot starting maybe in the 1820s, and they kind of peter out by the end of the 1890s. And it struck me as a particularly insidious device. I mean, a really insidious device. Uh, and I was intrigued by it, and I stupidly sent it in, and then it was like, oh, wow, how do I tell a story about that? Like, what's the link? Now, it's pretty clear that both of these, the, the panopticon that we know from Jeremy Bentham and that Foucault has written about so much, we know that this is about a, an optical regime, right? This is visual control, that the power in the center can locate and fix visually, and through fixing visually, control what's on the periphery. The penal treadmill is a very different device, equally controlling, um, but it's one where that what's insidious about it, what's cruel, what's particularly cruel about it, is that by separating these uh, prisoners, they, no one can control the pace. There, you can't do a slowdown 
Like basically you have to walk on those steps or you'll fall. And you can't slow it. If you could see one another, you could, you could kind of do a slowdown and life would be a little easier. But you can't. No one knows who's, the, who's, the, who's sort of driving the pace. And it's actually the generative nature of this, as opposed to the purely representational or visual control through mere vision, this is really a generative process. And I'm going to stretch as, as hard as I can by the end of this to sort of argue that this somehow resonates with the algorithmic um, regime that we're in today. But it might be too much of a stretch. I, I acknowledge that right up front. So if you want to kick this overstretched metaphor, you know, I'm pointing to it. This is, has a kick me sign on its back. But we'll see. Um, and basically what I thought I would try to do is to talk about um, what I see anyway as a shift in the notion of embodiment that we're kind of undergoing right now. I thought I would stick to the motion picture. I mean, the, the, I was asked to, to do it with film and, and VR, and that's fine, because uh, it helped me to think about film uh, in, indeed in terms of embodiment. Embodiment is a rich term. It's a term that's used in a lot of different fields, means a lot of different things emerges historically, 13th century, 14th century, that's when the term pops up. The M in, in embodiment is an action prefix. It, it's about making something happen, the M, and the body we know is the body, the trunk or the chest. Already it means that in the, in the 14th century. And that combination is there to talk about materializations or feelings of materialization. And obviously I'll be talking about the feeling, the perception side, since these none of these technologies truly embody, but okay. Um, so I want to just start with in, in, in kind of the, the contrast I'm going to try to set up is between um, a notion of reaction on the one side and generativeness, generation on the other side. Reaction in the sense of things your body does um, uh, to media, ways in which your body reacts that, that enable media to occur. And the generative will actually be ways in which media respond to the body. So that's quite a, quite a shift. Uh, in film, media are there, and our body enables the, the tricks and the conceits of, of, of the film media, film media in any way to work. But in some new um, applications that are emerging, including in the VR space, it's actually the media that is responding to the body not so much the body that's responding to the medium. And that's an, that's an intriguing shift, and I see that as part of a bigger, a bigger cultural dynamic. So let's just go through. Uh, it's pretty much like what I described in the little blurb, if you read it. The first um, notion that I'd like to talk about has to do with duration. I, I want to talk about uh, duration. I want to talk about space. And I want to talk about positioning or placement or setting. Um, so for example, if we think of the, the thaumatrope, Right? If you, there's a whole history of these 19th century, uh, even 18th century um, technologies. And the, have, have any of you used this? Uh, you basically sp pull the string, and it causes this disc to flip. And by flipping it, you see the bird in the cage. And, and we know that this was, you know, for years, mistakenly imagined as persistence of vision, but that's not, not what it is. It's the, the phi phenomenon. Um, so, you know, people like Jonathan Crary have written about this. Uh, Jimena Canales in her wonderful book, Tenth of a Second. Even, even um, Renee D um, Lorraine Daston and uh, Peter Gallison. And that, if you don't know their book, Objectivity, you should. It's a, it's a really terrific book. So what are the limits of perception? How does perception, how do we see things that really aren't there? Like the bird in the cage, or if you look at a, a, a phenakistis, in a kistoscope or a zoetrope, why do we see motion when there is no motion, right? And it's that perceptual, so I, could, I would argue that that's embodiment, that our body, by taking these discrete images and playing with the perceptual mechanism, by exploiting its, its, its deficiencies, its, its, its time lags, um, actually makes the trick work. The trick is not in the medium, the trick is in us. And it requires embodiment for this to happen, otherwise no trick. Um, so of course this is the this is the, the 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 foundation of the film medium, and whether we think about this in terms of just the perception of motion that occurs in those devices I just showed, or that occurs when you see one frame following another frame following another frame in a film, or whether it's the perception of causalities that occurs in the editing process. So the the, the classic Eisenstein Sergei Eisenstein Potemkin uh, use where you see a 
uh, a, a soldier with a saber coming down, and you see the face of a woman. And what happens in our mind is that we've seen the soldier strike the woman. But of course, we have it. Or Hitchcock, I guess, is another. The shower scene in Psycho, where you might think it's a very violent scene, but there's actually no violence. It's a knife and a body, a knife and a body, and a set of reactions, but no knife penetrating the body. But the cuts themselves feel it. That is embodiment, right? That is a form of embodiment. It's a form of embodiment that's duration-based. It's based on a, t a temporal sequence. It's based on the, again, the perceptual proclivities that we have. Um, so yeah. And it's used in, obviously, tons of ways. The film medium is built upon it. But it's built, at the end of the day, upon a reaction on our part. Um, this is a great film, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Um, you'll understand <laughs> more about what I'm talking about. This is a really phenomenal film by Peter Kubelka. And we're going to come back to Kubelka in, uh, in a bit. So the second kind of uh, embodiment that uh, uh, I'd like to talk about, reactive embodiment, has to do with space. And um, Again, this is well-trodden terrain in, in, in film studies, but, but again, maybe worth thinking about in this way. And um, goes back to, um, really goes back to the kind of development of three-point perspective in a way. So we're, we're back in the 15th century. Um, so the, the book, it's interesting, the book, the printing press, Gutenberg's printing press, and Brunelleschi and all those guys in the, they're, they're more or less within about 35, 40 years of one another. And both of these, and we'll come back to this at the end, but, but the, like the book, this, this notion of a world in which the relationship of the subject, the seer, and the object is mathematically pure. It's, it's, it's something you can really articulate. This is a human center, a subject center worldview, three-point perspective. And it's interesting that both of these pop up at the, pretty much the same moment in the 15th century um, because you might read them as technologies of self, right? The, the shift from a symbolic representational order in the Middle Ages where the important people are big and the trivial people are small to something that we would understand as, as more realistic is based on... Um, an ordering of the world that privileges the human subject, not the cosmic order or not some other way of seeing. This is about the subject. Just as the book takes the voice of an author and amplifies it, stabilizes it to some extent, that's debatable, and amplifies it. So these are, these are very interesting. It comes at an interesting moment because this is the moment where the modern, in the sense of the big modern, the modern is being born. So Descartes, Descartes with his... Uh, analytic geometry uh, is going to be someone who really articulates. This is the space he really provides theory for and, and grounding for. And of course, he's the classic, the locus classicus of this object-subject uh, uh, split, right? The, 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 um, so really, you, one might argue, and, 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 and I'll come back to this in the end with, with someone like Heidegger, Heidegger's notion of the, the Weltbild, the, the world picture, really is bound up in this moment bound up in the relationship between this, you know, the, the organizing subject, the seeing subject, and the world seen as a very like unique and distinct uh, um, sort of position. And so the, the, in this case, the, I mean, the Dutch, of course, did a lot, uh, among others, to sort of work out the, the math for this. Um, and something like the camera obscura is a really pure expression of this. So what we today shorten and call the camera, the, the photo camera. I mean, this is, this is its principle. It's this seeing trick that reifies, that stabilizes three-point perspective. Uh, you can goof around with the lens, of course, but like in principle, it comes right from this moment. Um, this becomes the basis for a whole series of immersive um, technologies and for a feeling of embodiment. So if we go back to... Um, 17, I think it's 1787 that uh, Barker does his patent for the panorama. Um, this is a space that's built for the subject, right? This, the world is stable, and no matter where you turn, it's, you know, you are the center of the universe. So it's very much about an enablement of a kind of, a kind of embodiment of a, of a spatial relationship. And, um, yeah, this next one's not going to work. I had a, a tool. There's a great thing, Pano... Pano, I think it's called. It's a great little tool that allows you to turn panoramas into dynamic ones. You can like, and you can turn them and make VR things out of them. 
but I didn't pay my license fee and it's the demo f like stopped, so okay. This pops up in film theory in a really big way with, um, uh, I don't know, the, the name may or may not say anything, but there's, so, so film has a, film's history is, is sort of plagued with reasons why it's, you know, not so, why it's trivial, let's say it that way, why it's trivial. It's mechanically reproduced reality, it's trivial culture, blah, blah, blah. And in the, in the 30s and 40s um, and 50s, uh, there was a, uh, well, so, so this gets redeemed in a number of ways. There are people who will argue that, well, it's mechanical, but it's actually not that mechanical. A German theorist like Rudolf Arnheim will look at all the interventions that are necessary to create an image. Like, you have to make a decision. Do you take the lens cap off or not? Do you, what kind of lens do you use? Do you focus it or not? What, what kind of f-stops are you going to use? There's so, you know, are you, where are you going to point it? What kind of stock are you going to use? Everything about it is a step, a conscious step that has to be taken. So to emulate the world, to mechanically, so-called mechanically reproduce the world, is in fact a fairly complex set of steps, and it's a, it's a conscious act. Someone like Arnheim would argue, therefore, distort the world and have fun. There are, uh, there are other, other theorists, uh, Siegfried Krakauer, who will make a big argument about real, the inherent reality capturing capacity of film, and therefore that's what we should do, capture let the world make its impressions. He's a believer in indexicality. In Let the world be captured by film. But the guy who's really interesting to me is André Bazin, a French uh, critic and maybe theorist. I think he was a critic primarily, who, whose argument about film had to do with perception. It wasn't about what you see. It was about how you see. And his argument was that the, the, what film did well was emulate human vision by offering us deep visual fields. And if you let the shot run a long time, a long take, the, the viewer would have time to sort of enter the image mentally or perceptually, enter an image and kind of figure out what was happening. You could focus here, this is from Citizen Kane, you could focus on little Charlie Kane outside the window, not knowing he's being auctioned off or sold, not sold off, he's being given to this kind of egregious lawyer in the middle of the frame. Or you could focus on the mother, the stern mother, sort of watching her son being given away for a good reason. Or the sort of drunk father pushing back a little bit. Like, where you choose to look is your business. Now, from American cinema, you, what you get are like relatively shallow shots that telegraph. It's much more like the durational stuff. You're, the meanings are kind of telegraphed your way. European cinema, often, and American, a few exceptions in America, Weiler, Wells, a few others, really would take a different approach where you could just kind of meditate on the image and let your eye wander. You could construct this scene in a lot of different ways, but you have to do the work by entering it. In a certain way, this requires embodiment. Much like the panorama, you can't just, I mean, you're there, but it doesn't work unless you really understand that that subject-object relationship. It's activated, it's, it's, it's tangible somehow. And this kind of film, this kind of conceit, this deep focus left with some, some duration is, is a great way to do it. Now, of course, some film forms, 3D, if, if you've, I don't know if you've seen Avatar, uh, also really, really exploit this idea, right? It's, this is a, uh, did any of you see Avatar? So what's interesting with Avatar in terms of 3D use is that where most 3D is stuff coming at you, Avatar kind of flipped it around and it was stuff that receded into the screen space. Like, it was, it was smart. It was a, a smart trick to do. Um, but again, it, 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 it just speaks more loudly to this point that, that embodiment in this case is a, is, is a, is a spatial trick. It's, a, it's, a, it's an optical trick, but it's one where we really feel as if uh, that we're, we're kind of on the spot in a way. And actually, if you go to the, what's so intriguing with this panorama, if you, Barker's patent is a really wonderful thing. Um, 18, what did I say it was? 1787. 1787, he does this patent. And he says, the patent is about, really it's about two things. Like, you might think it's about the, the building and a circular canvas and all that. That's there, but it's like once. What he dwells on and repeats again and again are two things. One the kind of perceptual claim of the panorama. And he keeps, he uses the phrase, to feel as if really on the spot. And he says that like five or six times in the course of the patent. The goal of this thing is to feel 
really on the spot, to be, being there. And the second thing that he spends a lot of time on in the patent is not the circular canvas. That's like one statement and it's done. It's the midground. It's the space between the subject and the object. Like that's where the trick happens. It's that sort of scaled midground that makes the makes the illusion uh, work. So, all to say, these are very conscious endeavors to kind of cr construct that feeling of being somewhere, to construct that 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 again that tangible sense of embodiment, even though obviously it's it's an illusion. And there's Andre Bazin. Uh, on the cover of Cahiers de Cinema, a, a journal he edited for a time. And don't, I, you don't have to read this, but it's just to say he's got a wonderful essay called The Myth of Total Cinema. And basically, it's, I guess you could say it's like virtual reality or something. What he understands is the myth of total cinema is just reconstructing everything. So a lot of purists in, back in the day were upset about the coming of sound, hated the idea of color, like just the, you know, they want black and white silent film was the thing. But Zan really pushed back against that. And what he wanted was kind of this complete, this complete immersion into a perceptual reality that was, that paralleled our own. It's a, it's, it's a pretty interesting essay. Okay, third kind with cinema, again, that I'd like to talk about has to do with, yeah, positioning, placement, setting. And in a way, literal embodiment, like what you do with the body. This is an incredibly interesting area. Um, I have a book manuscript that I may never finish, but I hope I do, just because it's so damn cool. The, um, just to tell you, in the United States, New York, uh, cinemas are, New York City, Manhattan, Manhattan alone has something like 600 Nickelodeons around 1906, 1907. And the mayor shuts them down by decree in 1907, because they're, a lot of reasons, uh, politics being one of them. He's, he's getting a lot of pressure about shutting down alcohol. That lobby is pretty strong, like it's very strong. So he needs to throw something to the clerics who feel threatened by... S uh, backstory. A lot of immigration, <laughs> kind of like a Trump moment back then. Uh, they were trying to figure out how to really suppress and control these unruly hordes. New York is something like 50 or 60 percent foreign-born in this period. So they decide to stop entertainments. Anything that's legally defined as an entertainment, they, if, like if you can shut that down on Sunday and everyone works a six day week, like you're gonna make people's lives miserable. You know, go, yeah, that's, the, that's the way they wanna do it. So they shut down, they shut down the opera. They close the museum. They do crazy stuff in the interests of suppressing these German singing uh, Vereins and, and whatever, the, the, all the immigrant theater. But by a loophole in the law, Cinema is defined not as an entertainment, but as a machine. That's its tax status. And it thrives, because it's the only thing you can do on Sunday. So the mayor really doesn't like this and decides to just, you know, and, and they, they were fire traps, it's true. These are pretty dodgy operations. So he shuts them all down. This is like 1906, 1907. And from between that period and 1913, there is a pitched and very discreet and hidden debate about like how to legally articulate the, the cinema space in a way that's acceptable for society. And society in this case is the fire insurance industry. The fire insurance industry is basically, basically threatens, they start with New York and they say to the aldermen, they basically design a, a what do you call it, a set of laws, a set of ordinances, and say to the city, you must accept these, A, you must say that these are happening written in your name, that you wrote them, or we will double or triple your fire insurance rates citywide. So the city folds. Now, what are those ordinances about? Those ordinances are about great things like, what's the width of a seat? Is, should there be a barrier between the seats or not? Because this is a period when there were often benches. Should there be a barrier? Well, in a dark space, populate heterosexual dark space, like back in the day, like, yes, barriers, and we still have them. How much light should there be in a dark room? Is there a legal minimum to the level of light? How much should the air change per minute? What's the volume of air change? What, uh, what about fire exits? How many, where, illumination? Of the this is all stuff, if you go to the cinema today, you will see the residue of these laws that were first established in New York 
uh, and then spread nationwide. The New York Ordinance is what most other cities copied because of the fire insurance industry that mandated it. Key to this is a discourse about the body. Lurk I, I have to watch my time here. Oh, shit. It didn't, the little clock didn't start. Um, when did I start? Does, like 10 after? Okay. So, um, key to this ordinance is like a, lo a lot of an understanding of the body and embodiment, the kind of control of the body. So there's a lot of discourse of contagion. You would think contagion is disease, and that's part of it. People spitting on the, on the furnace and the tuberculosis-ridden spit bouncing back. There's that kind of concern. But there's a lot of concern of moral contagion, that the underclasses and the middle classes mingling in the dark could lead to who knows what. Sexual contagion. I mean, contagion is, is a very ripe word in this period. And a lot of the architectural um, regulation here is really about mitigating those kinds of contagions. So it's very much, it fits very easily into the Foucauldian notion of micro-technologies of control. I mean, it's very explicit and literal in this period. And, you know, there's a lot of behavioral, there's all the kind of instructions on how to behave and when to talk, regulation of time, um, speaking, and you can't talk, you can't smoke. So a lot of embodiment in the sense of the human form, the physical form, is understood as something that needs to be regulated and contained. So this is a, a pretty big discourse. This pops up, oddly enough, and this is where P Peter Kubelka comes back, the mad Austrian Peter Kubelka. Um, this is a, the Anthology Film Archives is still around, but not this cinema. So it's like a avant-garde screening space. And Kubelka basically borrows from a architectural motif that's used for 19th century prison chapels. So the poor prisoners have to go to chapel, but they can't communicate. They can't see who's left, right, in front, or behind them. They're trapped in a little box, and only the preacher, it's Bentham again, in a, in a, in a way. Uh, except Kubelka wants the pure cinema experience. And again, it's very much about the body and entrapment and of course, there are more expressive uh, uh, manifestations of this address of the physical being, the placement of the body. This is Morton Heilig's um, Sensorama, uh, which kind of prospered in the 1960s. Seat would move. You get wind in your face with aroma. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a VR experience. Um, VR is a very broad word. It's not just the goggles. And this was certainly, emphatically, a VR experience in the, in the 60s. Uh, but very much about body, again, addressing the senses and the physically speaking. And we see this today, in, of course, in, in today's uh, VR, um, uh, forms of VR. Now, this is a kind of the installation version of this particular project. If you were to see it yourself, you'd probably use regular goggles. But this was the uh, um, and out in Western Massachusetts, D Doug Trumbull, who's like a major special effects whiz, you know, 2001, and I mean, he's done like mega, mega films to his to his credits. His he's got these like sort of semi-secret studios out in Western Mass, and his big thing right now is to find a way to do immersive three-dimensional experience, visual experiences without goggles in a collective open space. This theater, the the Magipod, will hold about 60 people. It's a it's sort of a, a you know curved encompassing screen environment. It breaks down and pops up pretty easily, so it travels around to trade shows or wherever. He's really looking for venture capital right now to do it at scale. Um, but again, it's all about when you look at like what this thing is. It's all about where's the body, what are the sight lines. It's this very very physical. Uh, Physical. You guys do this, the architects in the room do this for, for a living. But it's a, very much an acknowledgment of the physicality of the body, the limits of perception, and whatever. And, you know, obviously VR environments like the cave do this, right? The, the cave, which is... Um, so all to say, these three modes are, are pretty familiar, to, uh, experientially anyway, familiar to us. But I, I do think they speak to very distinct strategies for embodiment that cinema has been doing for a while. And that VR also does. VR is not the distinction I want to make here. There's a domain of virtual reality that uses all those old cinema tricks. So, so I'm going to talk a little more about VR in a second. But I want to make clear that VR is not the difference between this kind of reactive and generative. VR exists in both domains. Okay, we're going to slide over to the generative. The term here, I'm not happy with this term. I'm not sure it works generative. Um, 
Faroki has a really interesting term, uh, uses this idea of the operational image, uh, where what he means is an image that actually does something. All right, there's agency in the image. So, so this, at least the stuff you work on would be, would be primarily, you know, would be very much about this. Um, uh, uh, image recognition systems, uh, tracking systems, those are, those are spaces where the image itself is doing something. And it's, I, operational image is actually a, a nice phrase and I didn't want to take it. And I also, it's got a valence I don't exactly, well we can talk about in queue, it don't really like. But for now anyway, I'll use this generational. And there's a couple of different forms of this that are emergent. I mean, they're out there in, in like military always has this stuff generations before it hits the, hits the mainstream market. Um, but eye tracking would be a really, uh, a really good example of uh, how this stuff works. So if you think of um, foveated uh, rendering, so right now in virtual, if you, how many of you have used uh, VR goggles? And how many used, have, you, have done more than 360 experiences? Has anyone done like LiDAR or um, connect-based stuff, stuff where you can walk around around objects? Has it just been a world where you turn around or is it you, so, so the, the stuff that's coming, it's all, it's in labs, they're doing pretty heavy testing. There's even, I mean, this company, the aptly named Fove um, <laughs> company. So we're talking, so right now most of us are pretty familiar with number one and number two. 360, VR, alas, is a term that means a lot of different things and it can mean basically basically Barker's 1787 panorama, a fixed video environment, and you are free to like look around. It's okay, that's, or it can mean the stuff in the, in the, in the second thing that tends to be more um, real-time capture, things like, so uh, laser-based, LIDAR-based, uh, or connect, or photogrammetry, where there's a kind of interaction. You can move around objects. You can walk behind a chair. You can see what's on the other side of something. You can't do that in 360. But these are right now the two main kind of genres, if, if you will. Uh, CGI, of course, uh, animated stuff. But the third one is where the action is. If you've ever wondered why Facebook spent $2 billion on Oculus, it wasn't for the Oculus you, can, you will currently buy. It's for the next generation Oculus that has eye trackers in it. Because uh, you know Facebook's in the information business. And Okay, we know a lot about your relations. We know a lot about the stuff that you're interested in or click through or don't click through. We know a lot from Google as well. But this will track what you look at. And it, will, it tracks pupil dilation and reads, rightly or wrongly, reads that as a notion of, uh, of interest, excitement in something. So it's not just the shoes, it's the red shoes. You know, that's the, so this is, from a marketing perspective, I guess understood as valuable. And, um, where we put our values, like gold, yes, it's valuable. And this is the new space for that, um, whatever. Um, the point is, though, that, that this is a space now where something's happening, and it's not you that's controlling. I mean, you're looking at what you want to look at. But this is a system that's now reacting to you. Unlike the cinema system what we, that we saw, where you activate the image, you make the connection between the bird and the cage, you make the deep space really what's just white and black stuff on a screen, you turn that into a space you can psychically enter. That's all your agency. Here, there's something happening on the side of the image. The gen that's what I mean by generative. And the image, these tracking systems, are responding to your activity. They're responding to what you look at and feeding you more or less. Now, this technology is being combined with a second kind of, 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 of generative uh, technology that has to do with uh, the, where embodiment kind of plays out. Um, and that's emotion tracking. So a system like Realize, so that little camera on your computer, when you open it up, there's that little camera. Realize their business model is to watch what you watch, to, to watch you as you watch ads and then judge what's your emotional response to the ads. Again, a huge source of income, hard to believe, but it is. Um, and it tracks, you know, it's, it's not just facial recognition, it's emotion recognition. Long history to this, we can go back to the, to the 19th century and there are endless experimentations with um, trying to sort of figure out what are emotional registers as if these transcend time, space, and culture. Um, they pop up in lots of different ways, from a gestural system that Del Sartre works with to Charcot's work. 
um, mental patients seem to be the most expressive and the most pure, you know, untempered by the moderation most of the rest of us. But these companies today, these, these companies like Realize, have really made a, are making a sort of interesting business model based on just reading your face. So we have the eye trackers reading your pupil and your gaze, and they combine with these things that are reading your face to generate information, okay, marketing data, but also to anticipate where your interests might be. And th that's the side of this I want to talk about. The, the emotion trackers take many forms. They can take the form of, uh, as I said, facial recognition, but they can also take, they take a lot of other metrics, um, galvanic, galvanic skin response, heart rate, skin temperature, right? That's really interesting data in terms of how you're responding to an experience. So if you think about where, I just had a meeting, um, I think it was last week with the, it's being taped. So the president of a, of a major, the Chinese, the president of a major company, their Chinese operation, and they're in VR. And he said to me, he, we were talking about great VR experiences, and he said, wow, I just saw this thing last week that really blew me away. And it was a, it was a really compelling narrative. And I was like, it was amazing. And only after I did the experience did I realize that actually it was a very elaborate branching narrative. In other words, at every, any given moment in this thing, you could have done this or done that. And, but there were no, from his point of view, no points of decision. No points where you go through the door or go out the window. No points where you talk to this person or don't talk. It was a seamless, linear narrative. And he's, he was blown away by it. And he, he was bl blown away by, by how seamless it was when he realized its real structure. How did it work? With these technologies. A bracelet tracking his interest level, just, you know, assuming his interest level based on heart rate and whether he was sweating or not. Eye trackers. So that where he would look in the scene and if his pulse was going, the system read that as you're interested in this, we just, we just bleed in the next scene in that direction. So the narrative is being constructed, is being generated based on these, these kind of metrics of your, of your behavior. We aren't the one driving, I mean, it, you might argue we are, but it's actually an algorithmic intervention that's kind of sorting out and assessing, oh, you're looking here, probably you want to know more about that, so we'll give it to you, right? So that's what I, what I mean by generative. This is a very different order of, of media experience and a very different kind of embodiment, a very different, you know, it's the flip side of that kind of cinematic experience. Um, There's, if we were to look ahead a little bit, um, there's some kind of interesting stuff happening, and I'll just, I'll just mention it because it's spatial enough that it might be interesting to, to this crowd. Uh, um, but it's really putting chips, you know, we, 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 we have a lot of chips these days, and they're getting smaller and smaller. There have been, so this is a project that, that happened here with Sensible Cities, where a chip is embedded in a piece of garbage, you know, a plastic container, and it essentially tells us a story of inefficiency, a story of ecological irresponsibility or responsibility. Um, but if you think about the ability to ramp this up, it can go to a pretty large level, this inter so-called Internet of Things. One of, its, one of its really interesting capacities is, again, to shift, <laughs> this is shifting that sort of narrative agency from the human to another space completely. Um, so anyway, to, what I want to just, um, yeah, kind of, kind of wind down with, is to step back from these two examples and talk about the bigger, uh, maybe the bigger um, uh, implication. Um, and I want to use Heidegger to do this, his, as I mentioned earlier, his notion of the world picture. It's a lovely picture of him. I don't think I've seen a color picture of uh, Heidegger, and it's a nice one. Um, right, so his point here is the very fact that we can conceptualize our relation to the world as a picture is kind of the, is emblematic of the modern. And it goes back to, to what I was saying at the, at the outset, this, this idea of a, of a really clearly defined subject-object relationship, the thing that, that crystallizes in the 15th century, that Descartes really provides the underpinnings for, and that is with us today. This is about an order, the, the term that's used in the 15th and 16th century sounds like algorithmic, but it's actually a different word. It's, it's a related word, etymologically. It's algo, 
algorithmic. There's algorithmic and there's algorithmic. Algorithmic is this, is this um, domain of precision, of calculability. It's like what you want with your bank accounts. You want to know like exactly what's in there. The algorithmic is all about a formula. It doesn't matter what value systems you feed into it. It's a finite, it's a finite recipe. It's a finite set of steps. But the values are, are completely arbitrary. So the algo, algorithmic, this, is really about precision, calculability, predictability. It's accurate. It's exact. Right? It's, the, it's the thing that the modern is built upon, the big modern. And algorithmic is contingent. It depends what numbers, what numbers have you put in. It's very much about the formula, not about the content. So that, that notion of contingency and variability is really uh, quite important in it. And just to sort of put that in, in, in visual terms, um, if we think of Canaletto's uh, Piazza San Marco, this is the modern, that old modern, right, where there's a point of view, and that's the world as it appears to an individual, more, more or less. A little bit dodgy, but OK. But if we look at the alg algorithmic, this is from Photosynth. Photosynth, this is the old Photosynth, not the current one. Photosynth would take up to like 800 or 1,000 photos of a, of a space. Look for points of algorithmic similarity and stitch them. So you know this from your Google uh, Earth, uh, where a lot of images are kind of stitched together. Now, in that case, there's an efficiency. Like, it's as few images as possible to construct a space. In this case, it'll just take random tourist photos that are tagged Piazza San Marco and find points of algorithmic similarity and just lock them together into a space that never looks the same to any, any, any time you go to it. It's, you enter in a different space, and it's very hard to recapture it. If you want to see a good example, there's one, I think it's called, for nostalgic purposes, I mentioned this. It's called The Moment, and it's the swearing in of Obama. CNN or someone did this. And it's like eight or 900 crowdsourced images that, you know, if you want to, if you want to like go off and look at the tuba player, or if you're interested in Michelle Obama's gloves, I mean, you can just move all through this space. It's not a big image that you move around in. It's an image space. It's multiple dimensions. It's seething. It it's, you can't capture it twice the same way. So that's the algorithmic, right, in the sense of being highly contingent as opposed to this very stable individual um, that's more, this is the kind of the construction of photosynth. You can see that there's a ton of tourist photos, different cameras, different lenses, different days. Point cloud is made. Images are assigned to them. And we, the user, can kind of just kind of move around in this very, uh, again, contingent space. So if I were to sort of tease out the differences between these two regimes, this being the modern, the modern from the 15th century, until we still, we still, this makes sense to us, very much makes sense to us. Um, we understand the idea of a fixed point of view. We understand attribution, authorship. That makes sense to us. Who's responsible? Um, uh, stability, textual stability. We're, Everything we do, half of what we do at MIT is based on it. If, you're not, if, you're, if everyone in the class is reading a different version of the text, you have a hell of a hard time having a conversation. Um, this very clearly defines subject-object relationship. That's our culture. That's our philosophical order, our, our epistemological order. This makes good sense to us. But where we're moving, and what's creating a lot of headaches for some people, is, is so I have a documentary lab that focuses on interactive and immersive documentary. Well, yeah, there's a million point of views. Like, there's no right way to see it. There's no right path to take. Um, diffused attribution. These are often crowdsourced projects. Like, what's the right, what's the right, uh, who do you attribute this to when you have multiple authors? Um, collaborative text, instability, and of course, the enablement here is algorithmic. So these, this is a quite, a, quite a different kettle of fish. And we often look at this stuff as if, we look at it through the lens of the modern. Of course, we're modern s subjects. We look at these things as if. But as soon as you start a discussion, let's say with interactive documentaries, the question becomes, that, well, who's, who's point of view? And who's the author? And what do we attribute? And what's right? You know, um, the classic. I mean, we see this a little bit with Wikipedia. And with Diderot, we know who wrote the encyclopedia. If he's wrong, damn it, we can say, Monsieur Diderot, you screwed up. You know, this is not true. We know who to, who to grab. We know what to correct. But Wikipedia, 
the, the bot wars that are going right now on with Wikipedia is things are, it's morphing all the time. And it's rich and it's fabulous and it's collaborative, but it doesn't really hew to the, to the characteristics of the good old stable modern. I'm sure some of you in this room went to educational systems where you heard, don't use, don't use Wikipedia, don't cite it because it's too, in fact, it's, it's fab, peel back the page and you see exactly what's contentious. It's a fabulous source, but it doesn't hew to the characteristics that we're familiar with in the modern. Um, and so back to this, back to this crazy image. <laughs> I don't know how this fits. But I do think there's something interesting here about like these algorithmic interventions where we don't see them. So in the good old days of the ob subject object, life was relatively simple. At a moment of algorithmic intervention, it's a little harder to know your relationship to that object world because there's, there's something between you and that. There's something enabling, like with Wikipedia, there's things enabling this text to take form, and it may not be there in five minutes or, or tomorrow. You don't know, it may not, things shift from region to region, our car navigation systems, I mean, you name it, there's this kind of contingency in, involved. And, but it's very generative. And it, it draws on the power of many different people to make something happen. Our individual part is, we don't see it, nor do we see what's being contributed by others, a little bit like this scenario. And yet, in the aggregate, it's incredibly generative. So we don't really have a good assessment system for that yet. I don't know if that defends my use of this picture or not, but I will show you this quote um, from back in the day, from 26. Um, and it's revealing. It requires no previous instruction. No taskmaster is necessary to watch over the prisoners. Neither are materials or instruments put into their hands that are liable to waste uh, or misapplication or subject to wear and tear. And this is the point. And it imposes an equality of labor upon every individual uh, employed, no one upon the wheel being able in the least degree to avoid his proportion. And that's what I find so intriguing about some of these, like these image tracking systems or these facial recognition systems. Data is being gathered like crazy, or will be, and is, that's fitting into predictive systems that are generating text for us, that are producing things that, in a way, we don't really control. I mean, you can reject it, you can step out of it, but that old, simple mechanism of control that we had in the modern is starting to shift very, very rapidly with these generative systems. So, so that's a kind of embodiment that I'm really intrigued by. Um, and. Um, it's, I think it is a very different kettle of fish than the, the Jeremy Bentham uh, model, which is really about reflection, observation, a regime of visual control, yes, but not about, it's not generative in the way that the, 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 the penal wheel is. Um, and so with that, I will shut up and... Thank you, William. Any questions? Maybe we have 15 minutes, 20 minutes for questions. Questions? Thank you. Uh, thanks for a great talk, very inspiring. Um, so I have a question about you made a comparison between sort of the old, you know, stable regime and what's what's emerging. Uh, and before that, you talked about this one CEO of, of a company who was totally immersed in in that uh, driven, you know, this emotional embodiment, uh, and that gave him a completely new experience. Uh, so I was wondering, you know, what kind of genres are emerging through that, and when you think about, because you made the connection between those uh, branching narratives, of course there was an author behind it or multiple authors behind it who made those branches happening. So in, in your grid you said, you know, this is the new form is all collaborative. So how does that play with the notion of the authorship in emerging new kinds of fo uh, genres? Yeah, good, good question. And what I would say first is that um, the experience the guy had is probably like the best cinema or the best old school VR experience he's ever had in his life. In other words, he was not at all aware of the interventions that were being made. It just made a super old school experience, even though the mechanisms for it were super new school. 
Um, the collaboration comes from, like even in a path narrative, there's authorship certainly, like the environment is a crafted environment. But we don't, I mean, maybe we need to expand our notion of authorship a little bit to think about environmental authorship rather than textual authorship. But the text is actually, the text he experienced is actually, I would argue, a collaborative one in the sense that he, choices were made based on a, um, aggregated data from other users, that this looking here means something. It wasn't based on what he meant. It's based on the previous experience and what the coders put into it. And B, his own like optical choices. But he's in a conversation, if you will, with, a, with an environmental author, an environmental creator. So it's maybe two modalities of authorship, uh, the enactor of the, of the experience, the person who chooses how to connect the dots, and the person or the people or whoever who made the dots. But that algorithmic intervention is really a kind of data-based uh, set of assumptions or extrapolations or, 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 or summaries that actually translate, that kind of intermediate between what the user does and what the environment allows. So, and it's just, we don't have a good critical vocabulary for that yet, I think. I mean, that's part of the thing we need to develop. Hard to talk about this stuff if, if it, completely falls outside our academic traditions. I mean, maybe the mathematicians talk about it, but. Um. Questions? Hi, and thanks so much for the lecture. I'm, I'll, I'm trying now to formulate the, the question. Um, but I was, uh, it's the first time I heard about the generative VR as a, like a term, so I don't know much about what they're thinking of is is like is it a technology that's going to be like used in like movies or like uh, I'm not sure but it reminded me like this idea of like um the structure of having like more options generated by the user it reminded me of this discussion from like Alberto Eco's like open work I don't know if you're aware of it and and on one hand I think it's, it's like promise of more freedom or like more subjectivity like this more like collaborative work based on this assumption uh, this concept but on the other hand we can say that um, these choices will be like pretty much uh, finite so like the system might choose between 10 options so it's not really um, it's still like it's a pseudo like freedom or like is it really like empowering more the subject or is it like more like um, imposing like a more easy structure in the end because somebody could say that any work of art or like any movie is open like because we don't see the same yeah. thing exactly. So what, what's your good. like? Uh, good question. So you're indeed right, Umberto Eco is an important reference here. Um, and I would argue and have argued that actually this notion of, a, of an open text and, a, and, a, and actually a, a relatively, un, I'm not a very much of a believer in stable textuality in general. And the text I would look at would be things like the Bible. The Bible, like, do you know how many, just the Catholics, and they're pretty orthodox, just the Catholics have like 22 official versions of the Bible, if you look over over uh, the tw the, this last century and, and now and across, th there's a lot of variants. Put that together with the construction of the Bible from its earliest days of multiple texts being in or out, translation variations, endless quibbling about, there are, a uh, there are like, what the hell is the Bible? It's like a really very, very, it's slow. It's glacially slow, the transformations. And, but you can get killed if you kind of embrace the wrong one. So that's to me a very interesting notion of an inter, a, a kind of textual interactivity where the interactor is a community or an institution over the long haul. You could look at a shorter window at 19th century seriality where someone like uh, Dickens or Wilkie Collins would publish a chapter each month and then re-aggregate it into a book. But Wilkie Collins was notorious for kind of keeping his pulse on the public. And if they didn't like something, he would like change the route of the, of the chapters and he would rewrite it. He would do rewrites before the final book. So that's a kind of interactivity. Fully agree. What this stuff is kind of radically different in this sense. Um, we're thinking of it through the lens of the branch narrative, and th that's indeed what I said. But think of it from the lens of, like, YouTube. 400 hours per minute of video are being uploaded to YouTube right now. 65.7 years worth of video are being uploaded per day. We don't use it because it's like, it's too much. What if we had the taste predictors that we're using with Spotify? 
with image recognition uh, software. With narr there's a lot of storytelling software. Narrative science is selling millions per year of newspaper stories. Anything with structured data, like sports or finance, they just feed the, the data in one side and out come colorful stories on the other. You cannot tell the difference. Narrative science is really going for more creative prose now. Um, so put those three together, image recognition, taste prediction, and st storification. Uh, you can imagine being able to sort of go, to go into a data set like YouTube and come out with you know, a different story for everyone based on whatever. So, so I think, yes, looked at, looked at retrospectively, relatively few choices, it's what's the big deal. Looked at in terms of where the possibilities are and where we're starting to see the action, there are some really bizarre and exciting uh, possibilities out there. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you for a great talk. Um, I I really am interested in the eye tracking stuff. I looked into this a few years ago, but I haven't really followed it. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, in line with your argument, it's the idea, you know, that the that the image is um, this this concept of generative embodiment also implies that the you know the image is watching us. That the image is um, monitor. The image is an eye is a sensor and gathering all kinds of data about us um, that then has all these IP issues. Um, but I'm just wondering what the visual culture of generative embodiment looks like. Because on the one hand, it, it aspires to a kind of transparency and seamlessness, like, like the way you were talking about the construction of a narrative in a VR environment on the one hand. But then it's possible to generate a diagnostic view like to show the eye tracking report or the, the sentiment analysis on the face. And I think it would be great if we could begin to publicize more of those diagnostic per perspectives because it, it, it could generate more visual literacy around like how the function of the image is changing. So the image as a report on you <laughs> instead of something to look at. I just think this is so productive. For Absolutely. Yeah. And essentially, you're, I mean, you're making a kind of modernist with a big M, modernist argument, like you know, the way that uh, the, the disruption, the rupturing of seeing or the, the roughening of seeing so that we see more clearly, in this, in this case, through, through, through data. Um, yeah, I totally agree. And I think you know, part of the trick, we're at this moment where we're kind of, most of us are pretty culturally ingrained with a long, you know, a long as our, our, our art historical tradition, all of that's coming, we're rooted in that older way of seeing, and we're in a world of a lot of other possibilities, but we are inclined to want just to make that old way of seeing even better and even more seamless and even more, you know, the adventure even more evocative and, and more custom tailored rather than one size fits all. That's our inclination coming from the, the cultural space, but what's possible on the other side of that divide, or what's possible with that, to use modernism in a very different way, but that modernist ethos where it's about, where it's about seeing in a new way, seeing you know, astronomy or whatever, whatever uh, fair framing or whatever kind of term you want to use to describe that rupturing, yeah, there are great new tools there. I mean, the course, uh, we, I'm giving a VR course this semester, and we call it Hacking VR. We don't want to, we don't want to like replicate some immersive world. It's like this, how can we break this thing? How can we find its vulnerabilities and, and a new set of, a new expressive vocabulary? Like that's absolutely agree. And data is key to that. I think sort of feeding that stuff back is a great, a great way to do it. Any more questions? Thank you so much, Ray. Well, well, let me say, just let me thank you guys because it's like, A, it's Friday at 5 o'clock. Holy crap, long week already. B, it's nice weather outside. And like, I'm so impressed that you guys showed up. So just my, my thanks to you. So thank you very much. <laughs>